des activités scientifiques à l'Institut. D'ailleurs, je vous les présente dans l'ordre chronologique. Euh, la semaine prochaine, dans deux semaines plus tôt, jeudi le 30 avril à 14 h il y aura une conférence présentée par Katharina Dulit Novaes, qui est professeure en, en philosophie. Euh, le titre de sa présentation, c'est Reasoning Biases and Non-Monotonic Logics, The Case of Preferential Logics. Euh, la présentation a lieu pour ceux qui s'intéressent au W5215. L'information se trouve sur le site de Philopolis, Philo, F-I-L-L-O, Polis. La conférence sera suivie d'un cocktail. Voilà. <rire> Donc, c'est philosophie. Philo. C'est philosophie. Philo. Philo. Non. Comme les filles. C'est aussi sur ce site. Je pensais que c'était ça que j'avais dit, mais c'est pas ça. Philo Polis. Oh, pardon, l'autre. Oh, désolé. Ok, merci pour la correction. Ok, ensuite, euh, en juin, Colisso 2015, qui portera sur les esprits atypiques. Pour ceux qui étaient avec nous la dernière fois, je l'avais mentionné. Je vous répète en anglais uh, Atypical Minds, the Cognitive Science of Difference and Potentialities, qui aura lieu le 8, 9 et 10 juin. Uh, I would I'd like to underline the fact that it's open, it's free. You can show up and attend all the conferences you want during those three days, okay? And uh, finalement, à l'automne, uh, exceptionnellement, le cours pour les étudiants du, de la maîtrise et du doctorat, exceptionnellement, le cours ISC 8000 et ISC 9000 seront offerts conjointement par Pierre Poirier et le cours portera sur les architectures cognitives. Puis, en toute, toute, toute fin, je vous rappelle qu'en 2016, il y aura la prochaine école d'été en sciences cognitives qui portera sur le raisonnement. Voilà, alors Albert, je t'invite à nous présenter voilà. ton conférencier. Albert, le jeune qui est notre représentant du pôle traitement des collègues. Bonjour et bienvenue à tous. Je voulais surtout euh, souhaiter la bienvenue au professeur Yorg. Yorg. Last night, you told me just call me George. Yeah. Donc, <rire> yes. Donc euh, le professeur Jungström, qui est très bien connu dans différents départements, euh, éducation, philosophie, cognition, informatique, management. Je dirais que comme euh, j'avais l'idée en tête, il y a 120 ans aujourd'hui, euh, Slocum, le, un marin, le, le capitaine Slocum, a réalisé le, en trois ans le premier tour du monde à la voile en solitaire, il y a 120 ans. Et, partait aujourd'hui, le, le, le 24 avril, je ne sais pas si c'était un vendredi. Et je dirais que lui, euh, professeur Engelstrom, a navigué sur des océans de cognition et a rencontré <coughs> des océans d'activité. Alors, il va nous en parler. Merci. <coughs> negligence during the school years <laughs> and uh, so I, I'll speak and my topic is indeed concept formation in the wild the, the notion in the wild uh, may be familiar to you from the, the well-known book of Ed Hutchins cognition in the wild so it's a uh, uh, I have borrowed that expression from Ed um, but particularly this is not uh, just uh, about cognition in general, but specifically about concept formation. And I, I try to <coughs> make the argument that concepts and concept formation should be studied increasingly in actual life activities outside laboratory. Typically, Concept formation, conceptual change are studied uh, in laboratory settings or classroom context. And uh, there, regularly, the focus is individual and the concepts are predefined. In other words, <clears throat> there's something like typical uh, well established natural science mathematics concepts and the issue is how do individuals acquire them. <clears throat> uh, 
However, in our everyday lives and, and work activities, we increasingly face the challenge of constructing and understanding concepts that are not well defined and are not uh, indisputably clear. They are typically concepts that are emergent. Take, for instance, uh, global warming or climate change or terrorism or whatever. Those concepts that we face every day, practically, for instance, in the media, they are clearly uh, theoretically significant. There's a lot of research around them. At the same time, there's huge disagreements, disputes, even fights about the meaning and contents of those concepts. And they seem to evolve, sometimes even in ways which are very difficult to predict. Uh, and they also carry a lot of, let's say, ethical, political choices, visions of the future. So they are loaded. Um, I like to call it concepts in the wild. Uh, um, Jim Green calls them functional concepts. So these are concepts which are embedded in life activities. They seem to be necessarily collective, complex, emergent, contested, and volitionally charged. And they have serious practical consequences. How a certain concept like that is actually understood, defined, or even perhaps uh, sanctioned has significant consequences on people's lives. Uh, here are a couple of quotes from uh, Jim Greeno, who I think has nicely uh, pointed out this dimension of concepts. Concepts and their meanings develop and evolve in settings of practice and are maintained in practices because they are useful in conducting the community's activities. And more recently, by a functional concept or a functional user of concept, I refer to a cognitive entity that has meaning in a kind of activity in which it contributes to the way participants organize their understanding of what they are doing. So they are practice bound, they have practical consequences. And to push it a little further, my own particular interest uh, could be located in a, uh, a field where one dimension is the individual versus collective, and the other dimension is culturally given concepts versus a culturally emergent or new novel concepts. And my particular interest lies in the field where concepts are collectively constructed or formed and they are at least to some extent culturally novel. They are not really fully predefined and given by the powers that be. <clears throat> and that's, in concept formation, that's not a very well understood field or area. If you go back in, in uh, philosophical <laughs> studies of concepts, perhaps Stephen Toulmin's work in 1972, Human Understanding was called, was uh, to some extent an attempt to enter this domain. However, he looked at, uh, looked at it through the history of science rather than through practical activities that are uh, constructing the future. And uh, needless to say, the, the reception his book got from the philosophical community was uh, no less than devastating. So he did never wrote the second volume of that work. <coughs> uh, perhaps the time is now different, different hopefully, uh, and, and since I'm not a philosopher, I don't have to worry about that so much. So, um, devastating or not, uh, I'll try. But I need to warn you that this talk and the contents of it are work in progress. I do not claim that this is some sort of a 
complete, a neat, well controlled uh, uh, investigation or framework. It is something which is emergent in itself, and I, I, I very much welcome your comments and criticisms. Uh, uh, there are more than needed. To me, the challenge of functional concepts uh, can be uh, specified in, in uh, three questions. One is, there must be different kinds of them, different types of functional concepts. And what might those types be? Again, I'm not going to be able to suggest a, an exhaustive uh, categorization of functional concepts, but I'll try at least initial distinctions and perhaps uh, beginnings of some sort of a meaningful typology. Second, what, how are different types of functional concepts formed? And uh, this means that I need to look at my cases as they evolve. In other words, much of this work is actual field work in settings where concepts are actually constructed and used. And thirdly, what kinds of instruments are used in the formation of different functional concepts? And this might be, this might sound rather odd, because usually when people study concepts and concept formation, concepts are taken to be pretty much standalone entities. Now, as far as I can see, in real life, we need all kinds of devices to make sense of challenging issues and to turn them into conceptualizations and perhaps even stable concepts. And these devices range from, uh, you know, so-called pre-existing knowledge to all kinds of material devices and represent representational tools in particular. The, uh, in order to construct the concept, it typically has to re represent itself, at least what one would think so. Uh, whether it's in models or in writing or in, in, in whichever modality. So I'm particularly interested also in the different modalities of representing those emergent functional concepts in real activities. <coughs> I have three cases. This is an ongoing fairly large-scale research project in which we have particularly been following and looking at the emergence of uh, concepts in three settings. One of the, the first one of them is, is a group of uh, carpenters building a large, building, lock, building large wooden fishing boats at the Bay of Bengal in India. What's particular about this group is that uh, they don't read or write. They build very large vessels without any drawings or blueprints. So it's a rather interesting case as such, also anthropologically. <coughs> the second case is construction of a concept of collaborative pest management uh, among greenhouse tomato growers in Finland. They, uh, these people are facing the problem that uh, there is a pest called whitefly which destroys their crops and they are used to working each one of them as an independent entrepreneur even though they live in the same village they are competitors basically with one another but uh, the problem is that the white fly doesn't really respect the boundaries between these entities so the research simply moves from one place to another and so uh, they face the challenge of doing something together and there is in fact uh, a, a sanctioned official concept, for instance, sanctioned by the European Union, which is called integrated test management. Most of these farmers have never heard of it, or if they have, they are not particularly keen to look at the 100 page documents defining what is integrated test management. They actually need to do something about this issue. So, in a way, like, like typically, many, in many cases, you, you, you work with a real pressing situation that needs a conceptualization. At the same time, there are, of course, all kinds of offerings, sometimes coming from above, telling you that this would be the right way to do it. But 
it might be just simply too clumsy and complicated to implement something which is given. And the third case is uh, uh, creation of a concept of sustainable physical mobility for old people living at home and receiving home care in the city of Helsinki. Uh, for them, the issue is that the people are increasingly kept at home uh, when, you know, an, an, an increasingly large percentage of people are old and in our society, at least in Finland and like in many other places, and it's very expensive to put them in any institutions. And so, and it seems that it might be even more humane to keep them as, at home as possible, as long as possible, although it's not always so sure, but it's definitely cheaper. And uh, uh, then the, the situation emerges that, uh, surprisingly enough, many of these people who are living at home alone with various kinds of illnesses uh, rapidly start losing their physical mobility. And this is particularly pertinent in places like Finland and in Canada, where part of the year is very slippery. So if you go out, you fear for falling. And this might lead to permanent loss of mobility, for instance, breaking your hip. Therefore, you're very conscious of the danger of movement. And uh, so this requires that somehow a concept is developed that allows these people to somehow keep or develop and, and nourish their physical mobility because it is well known that the loss of physical mobility often is connected to uh, the loss of other aspects of human agency and, and independence, including cognitive and other functions. So these are the three sites uh, in which we have done long field fieldwork, and I will discuss these sites through these three questions. So the first question was what types of functional concepts may be identified? And the first case is the building of these wooden fishing boats at the Bay of Bengal. These are some images. Um, we chose this uh, purposefully because it looks like nothing new. This is a very old craft, and the model of the, of the ship is, is also quite old. They have been building this specific type of boats perhaps a hundred years. It is not known. There is no history with them about this particular kind of boat, but it's a demanding vessel to build, and at the same time, it challenges the idea of uh, concept formation as constructing something new. So you might say it's just simply repeating what is already here. Now, uh, like I said, these people, it's a, it's a group of carpenters who come move uh, to the village where the fishermen live. Uh, a certain time of the year and work there for a few months to build at least one, if not two, boats for the fishermen. They have no drawings or blueprints, hardly any representation of devices, uh, even the tape measures are very, very rare. Uh, in a way, you could say that the boat is its own representation. There is, if, when we ask them to describe or name the boat, they didn't understand the question. That's there. They <laughs> uh, in other words, they, and when we presented photographs of the boat to them, it was the first time they had seen these photographs, and they found it rather funny. It was for them. It was a very peculiar. Why would anybody need a photograph of the boat? Because it's right there, and uh, and. And there are plenty of them also on the sea. So if you want to go to the harbor, check it out for yourself. There is the ball. In other words, it is something where the, you, my claim is that this is a, an interesting case where you could argue that the physical object is its own concept. Uh, 
most of the builders have minimal schooling and cannot read or write, like I said. Yet this 18 meter long fishing boat is completed in time and becomes a seaworthy vessel that passes strict government inspection. Uh, each year this happens, it is uh, rather amazing. And these uh, boats are, uh, are used to carry out fishing trips which keep uh, them uh, for 12 days at a time in open seas. So they are in, uh, operating in very, very demanding conditions. I would call this as a prototype, I call it as a prototype. Now, this is not to be confused with the uh, the notion of uh, prototype concepts uh, uh, put forward by Adam and Roche already in the 1970s. Let me try to explain what I mean by prototype. The material object here is its own concept. It is not represented in any other stable external medium. Uh, each bolt, in a way, is a prototype of itself, similar to previous ones, but also a unique individual. <coughs> There's always some significant differences between the individual cases. At the same time, they are, each one of them represents clearly a, 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 a shared, continuous model. <coughs> now, compare this to another case uh, that's been written about by David Turnbull, uh, Gilles Foucault here, and others. Uh, the, namely the medieval cathedrals. <clears throat> In fact, Fouconier and Turner write about the Gothic cathedral. The building becomes modified in imagination so as to accept topological projections from the theological space. Over generations and generations, theologians, theologians elaborate this blend, and those who present the theology use it. The result is a fabulous emergent concept, namely the Gothic cathedral. So they take the Gothic cathedral as its own concept. It is a concept in itself. Uh, and Turnbull describes the construction of the Chartres cathedral. The design is not the well-controlled and harmonious entity, but a mess. Altogether, there were nine different contractors or masters, master masons who took between 25 and 30 years to build the cathedral in 30 distinct campaigns. There were 13 major design and structural changes in the 30-year period, but there was no overall designer, just successful builders. It was the ad hoc accumulation of the work for many men. Uh, again, there were no drawings. Uh, it seems that uh, the, the early and most classic cathedrals were built without drawings, without blueprints and without an architect. So it, it has some interesting similarity. And what I'm saying here is that it seems rather an uh, interesting possibility, at least, that we could think of one type of concepts as being representations of themselves rather than concepts about something. And it's a little bit like um, when we talk about the concept car, um, you know, it's a, it means that it's a it's a model. It's a, it can be a car that you can actually drive. At the same time, it's some it represents a, a possible car. In this case, uh, the the concept boat is not just a possible boat, but it's already a boat that is continuously used and built. <coughs> So that's the first case. Now the second case, it's collaborative pest management among greenhouse tomato growers. This is their village, an aerial photo of their village. And the challenge is the following. You have the individual perspective of the individual greenhouse grower here. And the problem is that the white fly flies around and crosses boundaries between the different farms. And this requires a collective perspective. In other words, how do you move from this notion 
that each one of us takes care of his own business to something like that we need to master this uh, this uh, threat this pest in a through a joint effort so it's <clears throat> not so much conceptualizing the the pest as a bio biological creature although that's a big part of it they need to understand the behavior and, uh, and, and uh, of, of this pest. But more than that, they need to understand their own behavior and to reorganize it <clears throat> to meet the challenge of the pest. So just briefly to look into the, what they came up they, eventually they came up with was an entirely new model for their own activity in which they have to operate together to monitor the pest and to prevent its, its pro proliferation. <clears throat> this happened through multiple steps of modeling. And typically, the concept serves as a device for diagnosing states of a complex system. In this case, the states of how much pests are and where and how are we supposed to eliminate them or prevent their proliferation? Uh, the concept is typically represented as a graphic or mathematical model or a series of models which depict reciprocal causal connections. Often a whole series of models are needed to construct and apply the concept. Again, if you use a comparative, comparative case, this is the work of Nancy Nersessian on uh, model-based reasoning. She has uh, studied various uh, groups of laboratory scientists and how they <coughs> construct their concepts uh, through uh, model-based reasoning, as she calls it. And the concept in this case emerges in efforts to simulate complex real phenomena. In other words, the concept uh, is a systems model, a dynamic systems model. Uh, their session writes, engineering scientists think by means of the artifact models they design and build. They translate their understandings of the phenomena under investigation into real-world simulation models and revise their understandings through simulation. Model systems are what sociocultural studies of science refer to as the material culture of the community, but are also what cognitive studies of science refer to as the cognitive artifacts participating in the representational reasoning and problem-solving processes of a distributed system. No other concepts can emerge from systems in the course of experimenting via these machineries, as she calls them. So the models themselves form a complex machinery, quote unquote, which it, it's, it's, it's generative. It generates new models as uh, it's used and put into practice. And, uh, this is exactly what was emerging among those uh, tomato growers with the help of uh, a couple of extension workers and, and a biologist who were working with them. <clears throat> Perhaps not as sophisticated as, uh, as laboratory scientists would, would have generated, but very functional and, and quite similar in many respects. And the third case. The issue of sustainable mobility in home care of the elderly and healthy. <clears throat> Our standard concept of, of physical mobility is, is typically dominated by, by three features. It's achievement oriented, separate from ordinary life and, and very individualistic. The image of a physically mobile human being often is associated with an athlete or an adventurer or some kind who uh, uh, performs uh, nice feats with his or her body and, and uh, in that sense represents also a youthful image of mobility. Uh, this does not very well fit with uh, this. Uh, how does our standard concept of physical mobility apply to all sick people living at home? And <clears throat> So this was the need for a novel concept. Uh, if you ask uh, these, uh, these uh, people to engage in uh, physical exercises, uh, 
that's not necessary, you know, uh, jump up and down and uh, do this and that, uh, perhaps build a box, kickboxing, uh, it's not necessarily a very good idea. So, something else needed to be constructed. What we did with um, this uh, case was that together with the, the home care services of uh, the, the uh, health care, uh, uh, public uh, municipal health care of the city of Helsinki, we uh, uh, it started to implement um, a simple uh, what was called mobility agreement. In, in other words, the home care worker would go to the, the client's home uh, on a regular visit and present the, the idea that why don't we uh, design a few physical exercises which we can do partly together, partly perhaps you can do them alone, and we agree which ones they are and we follow up and see how they fit in your everyday life. 